Hi, I'm Douglas Mason, President and CEO of Magnum Gold Corp, MGI and the TSX Venture Exchange. A 2015 drill program on the LH property intersected several high-grade gold intersections, including 11 meters of 20.66 grams per ton gold. Additional drill targets on the LH property have been identified by a 2018 drone airborne magnetic survey to further evaluate a pyrotite enriched gold bearing system. Please visit our website at magnumgoldcorp.com. You're listening to HowStreet.com Radio, available online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. Welcome to HowStreet.com Radio, the online source for market opinions. Here is Jim Goddard. My guest is Stuart Muir, Executive Director of the Resource Works Society. Welcome back to the show, Stuart. Thank you, Jim. Stuart, you're at the Natural Resources Conference or Forum in Prince George, British Columbia. What's the buzz around there? Well, this is the biggest uh, conference of its kind in B.C., in Western Canada, actually, and it's the biggest conference, period, in the North. Happens once a year, and it's been happening probably 16, 17 years now, I think. Um, what's the buzz? Well, everyone is talking about, I think, uh, issues around the environment and First Nations, and also, let's not forget the economy. That's actually at the heart of it all, because the natural resource sector is still, in 2019, really the engine of the BC economy in a lot of important ways. We've heard that over and over again in different ways from all kinds of speakers. I just came from the Federal Natural Resource Minister. He just finished speaking. And at lunch today, we had Premier John Horgan speak. We've had his cabinet come out and, and, and talk about these issues. None of this happens without complex policy around it. There are lots of challenges in doing things safely, making sure all the benefits are spread around to where they must go. So tons of topics, you know, uh, LNG is one of them, forestry, a lot of stuff happening in forestry right now, mining as well, and uh, lots of other things too. Carol Taylor, when she was provincial finance minister, and people may still even remember her back from her CTV days, but she said as finance minister, she had nightmares about the price of natural gas going up one cent or down one cent because it meant literally millions to the provincial coffers on royalties. How mm -hmm. important is natural gas and LNG to the B.C. economy and the government's income? Well, yes. Back when she was a finance minister in the early 2000s, that was almost the, the golden years of provincial revenues from LNG. There were billions of dollars a year in royalties that came in. It's a very different picture right now, although it could be like that again in future if we do get LNG brought to the finish line by 2024 or so and have the first exporting major project that uh, that is getting BC natural gas to Asia where it's worth a lot more. And even so, though, even though the royalties aren't quite the same as they were, you know, 15 years ago, it's important because it creates a lot of jobs. You know, one one resource job in northeast BC probably creates as much value to the economy as, as five average jobs. That's just because of People and resources, they're creating things that are sold in international markets that bring money directly back into the Canadian economy. And that's why they, they do create five or six times more GDP impact. And that, that's one reason why uh, governments who collect money from income tax that they use to you know, keep the lights on at the schools need to see that. So natural gas is not just something in your barbecue, your hot water tank, in your stove. It, it's something that truly drives the economy. We have some of the world's most, um, I would say, geologically uh, perfect sources of natural gas, low carbon, very deep, the, the Montney Formation in northeast BC, and there are probably you know, hundreds of years of natural gas that we can extract from there to the, you know, the benefit of our of our trading economy and and people who use the commodity themselves. Why is it in just the last couple of years people all of a sudden are against natural gas when it was always touted as a clean or one of the cleanest sources of energy? Well, one of the reasons given, and I'm not saying I accept it, but I think there is something to what you say because in the move from what's known as conventional gas to unconventional, we've moved into the use of hydraulic fracturing or fracking for short, and it's it's very true that there are a different set of issues with unconventional gas extraction as opposed to the old-fashioned kind. There's a great analogy people use who try to explain the difference between the old way and the, the new way. 
because the easier gas in the past, you would, it was like poking a straw into a jelly donut, if you can think of that, and sucking the jelly out. That's sort of how they got the gas out. Nowadays, it's tiramisu. It's like a tiramisu dessert. You have to go through these layers to get to the good stuff at the bottom, and then you have to you have to fracture that bottom layer using water and sand under pressure, and then the gas will flow out. So it's a very different kind of uh, not only dessert, but also a way of getting natural gas. And some of the uh, risks that are associated with a new way of doing it, which is really the only way we can, we can do it, because all the conventional gas is pretty much gone where it's accessible, is, uh, you know, water management is really, really important. So there's a lot of regulation around that. Things like seismicity, because when you break rock, it, it, you know, can be, you can measure the impact. It doesn't mean it's an earthquake. It just means that it's measurable and you, you have to be careful in how you do that. And they do have standards and regulations and practices for all that. And then there's, uh, you know, other issues that come with it. So I think that's led to there being probably more attention to the extraction side of natural gas than there used to be. But, you know, when you come to a conference like this, it's full of geologists and regulators and technical people who have a, a deep understanding of these issues. And you get to know them and understand how they approach their their professions. I think it, it gives me a lot of confidence that these things are being done correctly. We'll have more with Stuart Muir right after this. Hi, I'm Douglas Mason, President and CEO of Magnum Gold Corp, MGI and the TSX Venture Exchange. A 2015 drill program on the LH property intersected several high-grade gold intersections, including 11 meters of 20.66 grams per ton gold. Additional drill targets on the LH property have been identified by a 2018 drone airborne magnetic survey to further evaluate a pyrotite enriched gold bearing system. Please visit our website at magnumgoldcorp.com. I'm Kelly Jennings, CEO of PowerBand Solutions. PowerBand is a cloud-based provider of auction, inventory, and finance solutions that make buying, selling, and financing vehicles more efficient. PowerBand Solutions trades on the TSX Venture Exchange symbol, PBX, and on the OTCQB symbol, PWWBF, and on Frankfurt symbol, 1ZV. For more information, please visit us at PowerBandSolutions.com. Welcome back. We're speaking with Stuart Muir. Stuart, the Premier addressed the BC Natural Resources Forum. Uh, what did he have to say, and did he face any interesting questions? Well, well, you know, I think what he's broadly trying to say to this group is, look, uh, we're a government like every other government. We need to have a solid economy, and we are prepared to do what's needed to make that happen. You know, the NDP is is a government or party that with the resource community, I think they have a... a a past uh, of past memory of previous governments there where there's been more conflict on resource issues, access to the land, environmental issues. And I think, you know, for him to address 1,100 resource people and say, I've got your back is important for those people to hear. But they're also asking questions. Does he really mean it? So I think he, he really came up here. You could see from his speech and his, his remarks that he wanted to show them he was authentic and genuine in that, and he was giving us some evidence of why he can say this. And I think, he, you know, the reforms they're doing in forestry, he argues that this is going to make it more efficient, more sustainable to have forestry. It, let's face it, there's a lot of issues right now. Fiber access and, and forest fires have, have caused a lot of problems for supply to mills. There's international competitive issues. You look at the software dispute with the USA, developing new markets in Asia. It's really a tough space. I think he's doing some good things. On the other hand, I think there's some issues that um, they're addressing in a way that are not going to find favor with everybody, such as raw log exports from the coast. That gets into politics, interesting stuff. So we'll see how they do on that. That's one thing. I think LNG, we heard a very clear message on the need for BC to be an exporter of, of natural gas in the form of liquefied natural gas or LNG. And, you know, convincingly, he showed us that the changes to the tax regime for LNG were successful ones that the NDP made. Um, and don't forget, it was in the 1990s where Dan Miller, who was premier for a time, was the NDP premier and energy minister who actually put the regulatory regime in place that has allowed the Northeast to really flourish in natural gas. So they have credit for that. Dan Miller's on my 
Advisor Council, Council at ResourceWorks. You can see that on ResourceWorks.com. And, you know, he's really been a visionary. And, and John Horgan, I think, is well known for having <clears throat> had a close relationship with, with Dan over the years. So I think that's known and appreciated in a place like this. Um, there's other issues, I think, that are more delicate, like the Trans Mountain Pipeline. If you want to ask the Premier about that issue, I think you'll get some, uh, you know, fancier footwork because it's a politically difficult one, especially in the Lower Mainland where so many votes are. When it comes to the First Nations and support for LNG, I believe that the elected Aboriginal leaders uh, were in favor of it, along with most of their community members. But we have hereditary chiefs who say they're against it. Who are these hereditary chiefs and how do you deal with people who can perhaps just about anybody can claim that somewhere along the line some they had a chief in their uh, past? Yeah, well, I think broadly the, the picture there is the First Nations really do want uh, LNG. I mean, if, you, if you take as evidence of that the t- testimony of the First Nations leadership, uh, I personally have traveled for the purpose of understanding it firsthand and met with chiefs and counselors along Highway 16 out to the coast. I, I, did, I wanted to see whether it was true, and sure enough, uh, when I did this last summer, I found that their stories were authentic and, and their need to be able to fund programs to help their communities, to help fund health centers, to have a long-term fiscal stability. Because contrary to what a lot of people might think, there is not a truckload of federal money driving around to First Nations reserves, dumping cash on the ground. Like, they struggle for basics. I mean, it's well known. The water crisis, clean water for drinking on, on Canadian indigenous reserves is, is a major national health crisis, and it's not getting the attention it deserves. So that's not because they have too much money. They, they need ways to have those. So 20 or 25, depending on how you measure it, First Nations have agreements with LNG Canada and the pipeline that will serve LNG Canada with natural gas. And if you go to Fort St. John, I was up there a couple of weeks ago talking to First Nations business owners um, a couple of, of, of women who started their own businesses there in oil field services for natural gas, also in safety to make sure that you know, workers are protected. I, I met them and interviewed them. I thought it was amazing that they are so supportive of, of LNG. Now, there is in one very isolated place near the town of Houston, a point on the pipeline, which is in the traditional domain of the Wet'suwet'en, or at least one you know, portion of this larger clan. I mean, you, you, you could write a PhD thesis, and people have, about the, the hereditary governance structure of this group. It's very complicated stuff, but there's 12 or 13 hereditary chiefs who've got <clears throat> some sort of sway over this group. And it seems that there is, uh, in that one group, and this is where there are many, many, many different First Nations in those mountains of the Northwest, who have said we're not ready to accept this crossing our traditional territory. Now, I think there are some negotiations probably in the future, if not happening already, to find out what are the issues of those folks because they have, you know, severe social uh, constraints in the place where they live. They have conditions that are really unacceptable in any Canadian community that are just a daily fact of existence, intolerable. So I think we need to get at what it is the grievance and find a way to solve it because LNG is a project for the national good and we really need to solve that problem. We'll have more with Stuart Muir right after this. Hi, I'm Douglas Mason, President and CEO of Rainy Mountain Royalty Corp, RMO on the TSX Venture Exchange. Rainy Mountain Royalty Corp is a Canadian-based mineral exploration project generator. The company currently holds multiple property interests in Ontario with joint venture partners and is seeking further joint venture partners for other drill-ready properties in our portfolio. For more information, please visit our website at rmroyalty.com or call me at 604-922-2030. Don't miss out. Stay informed. Receive the HowStreet.com weekly recap with thought-provoking podcasts, radio, and articles delivered to your inbox. Sign up for the HowStreet.com weekly recap on our homepage at HowStreet.com. Welcome back. We're speaking with Stuart Muir. Stuart, the uh, court-imposed deadline for new hearings on the Trans Mountain Pipeline 
That deadline comes to an end at the end of this month. What are you hearing is going on there and have uh, people gone along with it? And have there been any new angles or approaches? Yeah, deadline's coming up. A lot of work being done on protecting killer whales and also indigenous consultation. And as this process uh, unfolds, you know, don't forget we're in an election year. I think there are political implications for the federal government going into that October election as to how this has been handled. So lots of skin in the game there. And then interesting development this week when we had a, an environmentalist group based in San Francisco with offices in Vancouver as well that has said uh, we would like to introduce a whole new topic for the National Energy Board, the NAB's consideration, that being they would like to see the upstream, you know, back where the the, the crude oil is, is produced in Alberta and the downstream at the consumer end <clears throat> emissions be considered as part of what they call the impact of the pipeline. And that was out of left field because the NAB process underway is on those two things, killer whales and the indigenous question, not about the emissions because the emissions have been addressed through the national carbon tax. There's a lot of policy the feds have brought in. Emissions have also been introduced by um the oil producers themselves and the pipelines, there, there are all kinds of rules on emissions. They, they've tightened them up because no one wants emissions. <clears throat> the, the, the less, the better. Um, so anyways, I, I thought it was maybe a more strategic move by, by that activist organization to try to affect the, the way that the public perceives this issue because the truth is that the emissions thing doesn't belong in this process. I think the NAB is going to look at it and say, well, you know, what, what's this? This is not part of what we're here to do. They'll reject it. And then guess what? There'll probably be a publicity campaign from that organization to, to, uh, call out the NAB or shame them for rejecting their demand on emissions. And it will become a sort of, uh, you know, political lever to try to, to create, uh, uh, interest around their issue. It's the kind of thing that groups of that kind uh, typically do. And I think even though uh, concerns about the environment are genuine ones, I think we have to respect the process. The process has got a job to do. The job is underway. Uh, I think it's most unlikely we'll see any deviation from its assigned mandate. Stuart, you've pointed out in the past, and I think it's a pretty legitimate observation, the more LNG Canada ships to Asia means the less reliance they have on coal. So you are lessening pollution by doing that. Mm -hmm. That's right. And another thing with, with pipelines, I mean, that's true of natural gas when it comes to oil. Right now, if you ship oil by other methods, be it uh, trucks, which is happening, or by rail, which is happening big time, um, those are, those are good ways to ship oil in, you know, they're everyday normal ways and nothing wrong with that. But, Let's be honest, there are greater emissions from rail because you've got a locomotive is burning fuel to get from point A to point B. A truck, obviously, that's using fuel. So um, to, to state, as Stan Dot Earth is stating, that doing that is, um, you know, more environmentally friendly than shipping it by pipeline where it just is, is or pushed through. You've got, you know, hydraulic or, uh, you know, uh, plants that push it through and create the pressure as though that happens, and that uses some energy, but I don't think it's nearly as much as and downhill uh, gravity uh, does. And downhill gravity yeah. does much of the work. Gravity is a remarkable thing, and it's free of charge. Yeah. So, I mean, they haven't found a way to tax gravity, have they, Jim? Oh, don't start talking um, about that. Yeah, they, okay. will. <laughs> they will. They will. You know, because we brought it up now. So you might have to just take out this portion of the interview. Otherwise, we're giving them ideas. Stuart, anything else you want to bring up this week? Yeah, well, I think it's, um, you know, back to the, the Aboriginal thing, the First Nations. There are so many chiefs I've been talking to in Prince George. I met the chief from the uh, local First Nation here, uh, who is an aspiring individual who gave us a, a rousing welcome when the conference opened this morning. You know, the, the degree to which rural First Nations in B.C. are part of the economic engine of the economy is something that a lot of people in the cities they might be aware of you know yeah, yeah i've heard of that well i'll tell you you go out and you meet those people they 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 got cowboy hats they got pickup trucks they are 
great, great people, salt of the earth, First Nations and not First Nations, who are just so much fun. I always love being out in, in the cities, towns, and, and open places of BC, meeting these people, because because they're one of the most special things about the province. And uh, if people don't find time to get out and experience that themselves, they're missing out, I'm telling you. Stuart, thank you so much for chatting with us. Thanks, Jim. Stuart, what are ways people can get a hold of the ResourceWorks Society? Hey, resourceworks.com, number one way. That's our website. You can sign up, get a newsletter, free of charge. We don't do any, you know, says just content stories, no, no marketing or hype or anything like that. Free of charge, resourceworks.com. Or if you also want to follow me on Twitter, when I have time, I love to get into some of the topics. I like to have a good, healthy debate. Sometimes it gets lively, even frothy. SJ Muir on Twitter. So follow me and be part of that conversation because it's important stuff. Thanks again. Okay. My guest has been Stuart Muir, Executive Director of the Resource Work Society. You're listening to HowStreet.com Radio. Find us on Twitter at HowStreet, YouTube, we're Talk Digital Network. Questions for our guests can be sent to info at HowStreet.com. I'm Jim Goddard. Thanks for listening. Comments made on HowStreet.com Radio are an expression of opinion only and should not be construed in any matter whatsoever as recommendations to buy or sell any financial instrument at any time. Available online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. HowStreet.com Radio is a production of HowStreet Media Incorporated.